Okay, thanks everyone for coming to this joint Intrigue RQMP seminar. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Nicolas Quesada, who is a relatively new assistant professor hired a year ago at yeah. Polytechnique uh, for the MUE uh, quantum photonics position. Uh, so on his website, he says he studies quantum photonics, optics, and information, or the interface between these three areas. Uh, and his group develops the theory and computational tools for next generation bright sources of non-classical light. Uh, in addition to devices for quantum computers, quantum communication networks, and quantum sensors. Uh, as I said, he's the MOE chair in quantum photonics at Polytechnique. Uh, and before getting to Polytechnique, he worked at Xanadu, a private company working on quantum computing and quantum devices for, with photonics applications. Uh, he was the lead developer on their software platforms, uh, Strawberry Fields and the Walrus. Uh, and he was, before his time at Xanadu, he was an NSERC PDF at Macquarie University yeah. uh, and a Vanier scholar at the University of Toronto with John Seip uh, and a Stoichev scholar as well. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce you. Oh, yes, sir. thanks. Okay, thanks for the kind introduction, Bill. Um, and my uh, I still hope people can hear me uh, on the other side. So yeah, my name is Nicolas Quesada and I just recently, well, about a year ago, moved to Montreal where I am now faculty at Polytechnique. And I'm going to tell you about this work that I did as I was leaving Sanadu on quantum computational advantage with a programmable photonics processor. This is work that involved a lot of people at Sanadu. Uh, Lars, Fabian, and Mosin were kind of the lead experimentalists. And Jonathan and I, well, I did most of the theory. Well, I coordinated the theory, let's say, and Jonathan was coordinating the experimental efforts. And it also involved people from NIST, and namely Adriana, Thomas, and Sae Wu. Um, and yeah, as I said, now I'm Polytechnique, but I'm going to tell you about this work that I did before coming there. So this is about uh, quantum computational advantage. So let me. Uh, start with this. Um, so the idea is how can we build a photonics processor that can show programmable quantum advantage? How can we build a machine that does something uh, that you couldn't do with just a big supercomputer? Uh, and then for that, I'm going to go over what quantum advantage is, uh, some no-go results or things that you could try to do and that won't work. And then about this, then I'm going to tell you about this architecture that we propose to do it and then how we actually did it. Uh, and for that, I'm gonna start by motivating this with this idea called the church Turing thesis, which is a tenet of computer science, a thing that people cannot believe. And here it is summarized by, by Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov, and it says, this thesis says that all computational problems that are efficiently solvable by realistic physical devices are efficiently solvable by a classical computer. So. There are these things that exist in the world, these processes, maybe it's electrons going around a complicated molecule or maybe electrons in some complicated material. Well, these things are, uh, these things are physical devices. And what this thesis says is that somehow this should be simulable efficiently in a classical computer. And if you are a condensed matter theorist or a quantum chemist, uh, you might be annoyed by this statement because, well, people have spent a lot of time thinking about problems in condensed matter or in chemistry where there are many electrons dancing around. And despite the efforts of many amazingly smart people, we still kind of figure out how to simulate them efficiently on a classical computer. So maybe, just maybe, it is because there are computations that, have, that are involved quantum mechanics that maybe you could do in a quantum computer that you can do efficiently in a quantum computer by construction, but you cannot do uh, in a classical computer. So the canonical example of this is uh, factoring. So if we could factor today in a classical computer efficiently, then you know, our security in the internet would be jeopardized. There is this immense incentive to be able to factor efficiently. And despite the efforts of many smart people, we still cannot factor efficiently in a, in a classical computer. Still the cost of factoring an, an n digit number is somehow exponential in the number of those digits. Um, but we know that quantum mechanically, if today we had access to a, to a quantum computer, 
uh, that was scalable and fault tolerant, then we can just run Shor's algorithm and using a polynomial number of gates and measurements, we could factor uh, large integers. And then, you know, our security on the internet will be again jeopardized. We could just go around and find everyone's secrets and maybe spy agencies will be very keen on that. Uh, but we don't have set computers. Like people are working really hard on building them, but we cannot, we, we still don't have a fault tolerant quantum computer with sufficiently number of sufficiently large number of qubits. So people still want to figure out if there are computations that we could do efficiently in something that is uh, sort of a not universal quantum computer that cannot do everything nicely, but that can do something that you cannot do efficiently with a quantum computer with a classical computer. And then there are kind of two versions of this. One is called boson sampling and it's very, very amenable to do in photonics with you know just photons going around in around in, in an optical table. And the other one is this random circuit sampling that is kind of more amenable to do things with uh with qubits, for example, in superconducting circuits. So obviously, from the title of the talk, you can tell that I'm gonna be focusing on this. So let me tell you a little bit more about what this boson sampling is. So this is boson sampling with n modes and n particles. The particles are typically going to be photons. And the problem can be stated in the following way. You give me an interferometer that is represented by some matrix U that tells me how the classical electromagnetic field bounces around this interferometric network. Then we can prepare some not classical light inputs. They could be single photons, they could be squeeze states, and we send them into this interferometer. And then the task, the problem is to generate samples, so collections of integers that distribute according to the quantum mechanical bond rule. So I, so I do the, my, my, my quantum mechanics calculation. I know that there is some probability, which is the product of a bra and a cat modulo square. I want to generate these collections of numbers and they occur with a frequency that is proportional to this inner product between this bra and this cat. So this is, this is the statement of the problem, but this is a little bit abstract. So I'm gonna start by breaking it down a little bit. So I'm gonna start by talking about these interferometers in the classical and the quantum regime. So an interferometer is just a collection of beam splitters. So here is a beam splitter. It takes two inputs, E in and E in one, E in two, and then two outputs come out. And well, two things can happen when we send classical light into this interferometer, the light can go through, it can be transmitted and it could land, let's say in the output port one, uh, or it could be reflected. And what we postulate that says that the, the relation between the classical electric fields is linear. So there is essentially some matrix T, which I is here that connects the inputs and the outputs. And this is just Maxwell's equations if you, if you want. Um, Okay, and typically, if, if, the, if there are no losses, which is an idealization, but let, let me do it that way. If there are no losses, then the matrix T that represents this beam splitter is just a unitary matrix. And that implies that there is no energy loss in the system, right? Um, now I'm gonna switch a little bit the notation, well, or the drawings, instead of using this for a beam splitter, I'm gonna use this that looks a lot like a circuit diagram. And that's because, as you probably know, theories are extremely bad at drawing beam splitters. They always draw them incorrectly. So I'm just going to go with that one instead. Um, but the other reason for that is that it's convenient that you can kind of do these things. For example, <clears throat> if now I want to make an arrangement of beam splitters um, with many modes, then, for example, if I want a beam splitter between the first two modes, as you see there with a the matrix U, that corresponds to this matrix here, where there is a one and this block of zeros to indicate that the third mode is not involved. Then we can get, we can do another one. And now the one is up here because the first mode does not participate. And then we can do once more. And I remember because this is a linear transformation between the electric fields, then I just need to multiply matrices to know what is the net transformation. And here's what I get, right? And also notice that, um, if I want all the fields to be able to talk with each other, I need the depth of this interferometer, this collection of beam splitters to be on the order of the number of input fields, right? So if I want light that enters from here to be able to exit here, I'm gonna need at least on the order of three, well, in this case two, but on the order of three interferometers, right? On the order of three beam splitters. 
So that's all classical. So now we cover um, that. And the other thing that I want to say is sometimes I just forget about that. And I just write this kind of block that contains all this information, right? Okay, so we cover what this interferometer is. It's just this collection of splitters. Now let's talk about how photons, instead of just um, classical light, uh, behaves in these beam splitters. And so there is this canonical example where we want to ask the question, if I send a single photon in the top port and if I send a single photon in the bottom port, what things can happen? So the first thing that I would like to know is, for example, what is the probability that the two photons exit on the opposite ports? So they, they don't come out together. And there are these, these things called Feynman rules that allow me to calculate this. And because my photons are indistinguishable, I have to be careful with probability amplitudes, right? So how could this process have happened? One possibility is that the two photons get reflected. And the other possibility is that the two photons get transmitted. And because these photons are indistinguishable, except for the five that are coming in different ports, um, I need to first take the probability amplitudes for these processes. So T12 is like this, T21 is this, T1, well, you can see there. I need to multiply them and then add them together. And then to get a probability, I take the modulus square of that. And then similarly, I can do this for this part and for the other one. Uh, and then this allows me to calculate these probabilities that appear in the Born rule. And if I take my symmetric beam splitter that I had before, this particular example, and I put it for this event, for the one where the two photons exit separately, I get this cancellation. I get the fact that they never exit together. So this is extremely important because this is exactly what allows photonics to be useful for quantum computation. And it's called the Hong Kong Mandel effect. And it's the fact that photons uh, never exit separately, right? Uh, okay, so that's kind of how we're gonna calculate things. Let me give you another example of, of how this works. Now for three, so now I have some complicated interferometer there and I want to know what is the probability that my three photons exit separately. So now what I do, is I look at all the possibilities it could happen. The first one is that all of them sort of go through. Then I have three possibilities in which two of them get permuted. And then finally, I have these two where everyone switches, right? And then for each of those, there is some term like this, some T, some multiplication of three elements of this transmission matrix that classically tells me how the, how the light in, uh, mixes in the interferometer. And it turns out that this thing, this sum of the different T's has a name in mathematics, it's called the permanent. So the permanent of a matrix T is, first of all, you look at the size of the matrix T, then you look at the symmetric group. The symmetric group is the thing that allows me to figure out how many permutations are there. And then I take products of different entries of this matrix T. And if this is new to you, that's fine, because maybe this one down here is not so new to you. So if you instead multiply also by the sign of the permutation, you get this thing called a determinant that I'm sure you all know from, from your linear algebra. Um, now you might wonder, okay, so what's the difference between these two or the fact that there is a minus sign? There is a very important difference and is that the determinant respect matrix multiplication while the permanent doesn't. And that very small difference implies that determinants are easy to calculate in a computer. So I could try to calculate a determinant of a matrix a thousand by a thousand. And in this laptop, it'll take like microseconds, if I try to calculate the permanent of a matrix of size a thousand by a thousand, it will take much, much longer than the age of the universe in the most powerful supercomputer that we have. So permanents are different from determinants. Right. Okay, so now we also answer this question about how photons behave when you send them into beam splitters. In, now we just want to think a little bit more about that. We can wrap it up and say, okay, so we have, an interferometer with a matrix T. We send some single photons in, in K, K1 in the first mode, K2 in the second mode, and so on and so forth. And we want to know the probability that we measure a certain pattern at the output, this thing that we call the, the, the Born rule, given by the permanent divided by these three factors that don't matter too much of this matrix T and K that I construct in the following way. Let's say, for example, that I send, oh, that I send single photons in the first three inputs and that I want to know what's the probability that I get one photon in the first output and two photons in the third output. So what I do is I look at my original matrix there 
K tells me which columns to take from that matrix, while N tells me which column, which rows to take. And because there is a two here, that means that I get to take this particular row twice. And that way I can assemble a matrix that is square, but that has some repetitions like that. And then I just take that matrix, I put it inside this permanent function and I get my answer, right? And so if you are a computer scientist, then this is the definition of boson sampling. Given a unitary matrix, you want to generate samples from this probability. Incidentally, notice that if we have fermions and not bosons, then we will replace this permanent by the determinant, right? Because now uh, when we switch fermions, we pick up a minus sign. And in that case, first, this, the problem becomes easier to do computationally. And second, you get for free kind of poly exclusion principle in that if you take the determinant of these matrices with repetitions, those determinants come out to be zero because they have linearly dependent uh, growth. Okay, so that's the description of boson sampling. So why people got excited about this? Because in this paper by Aronson and Arkhipov, they show that if a classical simulator could efficiently simulate boson sampling, then you could solve sharpy hard problems with a special type of clever algorithm. And computer scientists strongly believe that there shouldn't be such clever algorithm to solve sharpy complete problems. If this sounds a little bit circular, then for the physicists in the room like myself, this is like saying, we don't believe that a perpetual motion machine exists because if said machine existed, then we could violate the laws of thermodynamics. But we don't believe you can violate the laws of thermodynamics, so we rule out these perpetual motion machines. Okay, so this was really exciting because here is a machine that you can build that doesn't look too complicated to build. You quote unquote, only need single photon sources and interferometers that are stable and single and, and photon counters. And then you can disprove this church throwing thesis. So people said to do that. And these are papers from 2012, I think. I think I was still a PhD student. And the first one is for people in the UK. The second, well, among other places, the second one is people in Australia. And they do experiments with three or four photons in a six mode interferometer. Uh, and it turns out that's still very, very small, right? If you have four particles in six possible boxes, you have some not too crazy number of possibilities. And then the permanents that you have are of size, you know, four by four, which is still something that actually you could work out by hand. So, oh, and, and another important thing is the sources that they use here are these parametric heralded sources that we're gonna talk about in a moment. So then people thought, okay, maybe we can do with some sort of artificial app, push a button, and then some laser comes and hits these quantum dots that live in this micro pillar, and then we get a single photon out. Uh, and it's indeed something that people try. So there is this really impressive experiment from the people at USDC where they take up to 20 photons and they send them into an interferometer. And then they also quote this somewhat obscenely large number that we're gonna be is actually is actually irrelevant, okay? Um, yeah, so they, the reason why they can only go up to 20 is because making indistinguishable single photons is actually quite hard. That's something that also people here are actually working on and they can tell you that it's actually extremely hard. Uh, even though they send 20 photons, they only ever measure up to 14 and that's because there are losses. So sometimes you send photons and they got lost. They just went somewhere else. Um, and despite this 10 to the 14 number, which looks really big, that's completely irrelevant. The fact that even, even if you have 60 boxes and you have to put 14 objects, that's a lot of possibilities. That is not what determines the complexity of simulating these experiments. And this is what's pointed out in this very beautifully titled paper by the people from Bristol, where they say, with these numbers, you're not gonna get to quantum advantage. You'd really actually have to push it to like 50 photons. And so I've heard rumors that the same group from, from, from USDC are actually trying to do 30 photons, but even 30 photons I can do very conveniently in my laptop. So, so okay, so how do we scale up? How do we go to like many, many photons, right? Uh, so here is where nonlinear optics comes into the game. Um, so classically, what we know from nonlinear optics is that if you have, for example, two uh, fields come into a nonlinear material, uh, the term nonlinear optics comes precisely because the polarization of the material, the response of the material 
is non-linear with the electric field. So in particular, if you have these two and they have frequencies omega p and omega s, then you can have this wave mixing where now the polarization starts to oscillate at the frequency of these two, at the difference of these two frequencies. And because now you have an oscillating dipole, then you start to also emit uh, radiation in that frequency. And that's, you know, this arrow here, right? Now, quantum mechanically, there is also something interesting that can happen. And is that now you only apply the blue uh, beam and spontaneously, or if you will, mediate it by the vacuum, you can get photons coming out in the two, in the, in the red and the orange uh, beams. And you can think of this in terms of Hamiltonian where you have three fields, R, A, and B. The R we can take to be classical if you want. And actually that's what we almost always do. And you can think of this as the fact that you destroy this omega P photon and you create two photons here that are strongly correlated, right? And typically you do this with type two parametric down conversion for the people that care about the names of these things. All right, so if we have the Hamiltonian, we can apply it into vacuum to get something called a two mode squeeze vacuum state. Uh, we can do a little bit of algebra to show that this becomes that, which becomes that. So that tells you that the photons are always created in pairs. Every time you make seven photons here, you make seven photons here. You make three photons here, you make three photons here. And this was shown to great effect by this, in this beautiful experiment by the people in NIST and, and in Paderborn where they have a source of photons where they can make uh, this R to be fairly large, like on the order of three. Um, and then they have photon number resolving detectors. <clears throat> and then they look at the joint distribution and they see this very, very beautiful correlation between the photon numbers that if you plot logarithmically, it looks even more impressive. And the reason why it's not perfectly narrow is of course the fact that obviously you have losses. So even though they were always perfectly twin, sometimes one of the twins lost its brother and then you don't get the perfect number number correlations. So why is this useful? <clears throat> well, because making a single photon, which I'm gonna symbolize by a one in a wire, or we can use these two mode squeeze states to make a single photon by measuring one half of them and making sure that we collect a one. And then we know with certainty that in the other one, we must have collapsed the other mode into a single photon. So in fact, the, the probability of success of this heralded by a probabilistic single photon source is bonded by, by one quarter. And that's because if you look at the previous expression that I kind of went too far over it, the probability is given by this and this number is at most one quarter. And this comes from kind of both Einstein statistics, if you will. But for that, you need to be able to resolve the photon number. So a predator, one that says vacuum or not vacuum will not help you. You need someone that says one with certainty, one and not two and not zero, one. If on the other hand, you only have threshold detectors, then you want to make sure that this R is very small. And then consequently, your probability of success is also very small. It's, I don't know, a thousand or 10,000 or something like that. Okay, so with that, we can now take many of these two mode squeeze light sources, which you could potentially fabricate in a chip, making many of these waveguides or something like that. Uh, you could split them. You could take one half this, this herald, this heralds. You can make sure that you collect here a certain number of photons, and then you can use the rest to send it to your interferometer. And then what is shown in this paper by Austin Lund and his colleagues in, in Australia and in Bristol, is that this thing is actually equivalent to the original boson sampling, except that the places where the photons come in are randomized, are randomized by the fact that, you know, you don't, you don't know ahead of time which of these detectors are gonna click. But they show that that's okay. That still is gonna give you an interesting computational problem that will allow you to, you know, to fight, the, to, to disprove the extended church throwing thesis. Uh, and here's a little aside. So why they call this a Gaussian state? So they call this a Gaussian state because even, even though if you look at this state in the number number basis is this strongly correlated thing. If you look at it sort of in the quadrature basis in the eigenbasis of the electromagnetic field, it just looks like a nice Gaussian that has some, uh, some extra noise in the difference of the in-phase quadrature in the sum and some extra noise in the other one. So they have these correlations and it kind of looks like this when you plot it as a function of those two variables. 
Um, right. So another useful thing to know is that we can also make a two mode squeeze state by taking two single mode squeeze states and mixing them into our well known friend, the 50 50 beam splitter. Um, and so if we want to make this, where we could take all of these two mode single mode squeeze state to 50 50 beam splitters, and then this is equivalent to what we wanted to build originally, right? Now, you can think somehow that this is just equivalent to that, right? This is another box representing an interferometer. It's just that this interferometer has a very special property in that, for example, the light that started here can either exit here or can exit in the second half of the modes, but cannot exit here. Right, because there is no link between these two modes or these two modes, right? Um, but more generally, we could ask the question well, what if we take single mode squeeze states and we mix them into an interferometer? And that's precisely what uh, Hamilton and his co workers in Paderborn and in Prague did. They asked, What is this problem? What can we say about this problem? We take single mode squeeze states, we mix them into an interferometer that mixes everyone with everyone. So it's not like the case before where only some parts will be mixed. What can we say about this problem? Um, and so one first natural question is if these were single photons or if we had these funny looking interferometers, we know that we get permanence, right? This function that involves a symmetric group and that is exponentially hard to calculate. How about this? We know that at least in some cases should go back to the permanent, but what is what can we say about this more generally? So they ask now, okay, we have our squeeze states, which are represented by these squeeze ellipses coming to the interferometer, which is this T. And then we want to know what is the probability that we measure something, right? So for that, um, what they show is that this problem is hard to solve as well, in the same sense that boson sampling is hard to solve. And now the probability of measuring something at the output, given the interferometer and the squeezing parameters, how, how much these ellipses are not circles, is given by this new thing called the Hafnian, which is A defined as you see there. It's also defined in terms of the symmetric group. And you can also show that it's hard to calculate. Uh, and the matrix B that appears here depends on the interferometer. But appears twice. And on this diagonal matrix that you construct out of the squeezing parameters, which should be S, not R. So I might use R for S or S for R. So bear that in mind. And moreover, this, this Hafnian is a generalized version of the permanent. So if you have a machine that calculates half, you want to calculate a permanent, what you do is you just input this particular matrix, and lo and behold, you get your permanent. So certainly it must be that Hafnians are as hard to calculate as permanence because I can always use a half a Hafnian black box machine to calculate my permanence, right? Okay, so great. So we now want to build this machine, but we also want to think a little bit more carefully about how to build it. And there is an issue and the issue is loss. So, so far I was telling you, whenever you see a beam splitter, think of it as no energy is lost. So we have this unitary matrix. But actually in real life, some of the energy gets lost. So I'm gonna call the fraction of the energy that gets lost this eta factor. Uh, when eta is equal to one means no energy is lost. When eta is equal to zero means all the energy was lost. When eta is one half, which means you have three dB of loss. And now if you start to build an interferometer out of these imperfect parts, what you're gonna see is that you start to have a little bit of loss everywhere. And if you multiply all these losses together, you see that this loss starts to accrue exponentially in the number of modes if your interferometer is deep, right? So here we have four modes. You also need four layers. So the M that you have here is four. And we know that is four also because the beam splitters that we have are kind of nearest neighbors, right? We only couple to the things that are nearby. Um, so this is the first no-go result. We show that for most linear optical architectures where photon loss increases exponentially with the circuit depth, like the circuit that I showed you before, uh, noisy Gaussian boson sampling loses its quantum advantage. Or rephrase in a different way, 
If you have loss that accrues exponentially, then we can simulate the thing that your machine is doing efficiently, okay? And how do we show that? Well, the idea is the following. We have these squeeze states, um, and we're gonna show is that these squeeze states are very similar to other set of states that we call squash states, not squeeze, squash, uh, that, have, that can be easy to simulate, that are easy to simulate. So first of all, we have the vacuum. So this vacuum has, is a round ball. It has the same covariance as in the two axes, right? And this is for a single mode. Uh, then we have squeeze states, but now one of the quadratures gets squeezed and then to respect the uncertainty principle means that you have to get excess noise in the other quadrature, right? Uh, and then we have this lossy squeeze state. So if you apply a loss channel to this, what you have to do is to mix these two things. And what you see now is that if you mix these two things and the factor of loss is a to the power m, then you see that what you get is something that has still a little bit of squeezing. You see that it's still below the, the blue circle. And then you have some excess noise in the other direction, right? And now um, the point is that lossy squeeze states, these squeeze states where you apply loss are kind of hard to tell apart from these other states that have exactly no squeezing whatsoever. They're just at the vacuum level and then have some excess noise in the other direction. So these states are classical because they have zero squeezing. They have vacuum fluctuations and excess noise in the other direction. And, um, and then what you can do is if you want to simulate perfectly squeezed states in a loss interferometer, that is strictly equivalent to having lossy squeeze states in a perfect interferometer. So if this is an imperfect interferometer. This is a perfect interferometer. This has, these are perfect squeeze states. These are lossy squeeze states. So these two things are equivalent. This is just a mathematical trick. And then the point is that this is very similar to that. So these lossy squeeze states look very similar to these squash states that have no quantum correlations. And they have no quantum correlations because we can write them as mixtures of coherent states of just the thing that comes out of a laser, if you will. Um, and that's how we prove it. We just do some tricks bounding the total variation distance of the probability distribution that you get here and the probability distribution that you get here. And we show that they are sufficiently close in the limit where the loss scales exponentially with the number of modes. We also have a finite size version of this statement because the statement that I just gave is kind of asymptotically. I'm saying if something scales like that, then in the asymptotic limit, this happens. But we also have kind of a finite version of this, which says, if your detectors have this uh, detector count, dark count rate, and you have total transmission given by this eta, and you have this much squeezing, and the number of inputs that you squeeze is this, then if this equation is satisfied, we can simulate your setup efficiently. So if you ever want to build this, make sure that your setup is such that you violate this inequality. So, that's not great because if I want to build something like that, where everybody interacts with everybody and then there is a lot of entanglement between all the, all the involved parties, then what happens is that I'm gonna have a lot, of, a lot of loss, right? So what can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is to not build this, to not build an interferometer out of small parts that are faulty, but actually just build a big interferometer that is ultra low loss, but that has no programmability where there are no like individual bits, but it's just a big thing that mixes everything in some kind of random fashion. So that is kind of what uh, the people at USCC did in this amazing experiment in uh, 2020. So they take the equivalent of 50 uh, squeeze light sources and they mix them into an interferometer uh, that they print on a slab of glass, but that is not programmable. So it's just whatever happens to happen that day that you were annealing this piece of glass, that's the interferometer that you got. So you got this, that's a way to do it, but maybe there are other ways. So here is the way that we came up with where we do preserve programmability. We still want to have a lot of entanglement between the different modes. We want to make sure that almost everybody gets to talk with everybody. And so for that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use long range gates, not only gates that couple nearest neighbors, but gates that couple many modes that are kind of far apart. So I'm gonna represent my modes first as wires here. 
and I'm going to put them also in a lattice here. And so if I want to do kind of nearest neighbors connection in the lattice, the horizontal ones are easy. Those are just still nearest neighbor connections in the in my circuit diagram. And then I also want to do this, 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 the ones in the vertical direction, which are kind of hard in the circuit diagram because these are modes that are far apart, right? But in optics, there's actually a very nice way to make, let's say, these two modes interact. And it's the fact that I could keep the first mode waiting for the fourth mode in an optical fiber loop until they get to meet. And that's exactly how we propose to do it. So for example, if you want to do uh, nearest neighbor interaction between these two modes, you just make sure that they meet here and you have a loop that can hold one mode. But now if you want to mediate an interaction between modes four and one, as you see there, well, you now have a loop that holds three, four, three modes there. So now I can have long range interactions and kind of optical fiber is extremely good at this, right? Like we can keep these photons with extremely low loss. And now we can start to, you know, get creative. So we can do now, let's say 64 modes with three loops. So now I have a loop that holds one, and a loop that holds four, a loop that holds 16. And then if I drew this now in three dimensions, then I have this hyper, this hypercube, this cube of size four, where everybody gets to talk with everybody in their, in their vicinity, right? So I, there is now a lot of entanglement because this is nearest neighbors in dimension three, not in dimension one, right? And very importantly, the loss, which is mostly accrued in the longest loop, is not eta to the, to the power, the number of modes, it's not eta to the power 64, it's actually eta to the power 16, which is much, much better than eta to the power 64. Right? So now I, have, I don't have this issue that I had before where my losses are scaling exponentially with my number of modes. Um, I can then go on and think about 216, um, which looks like that. And now again, the biggest losses are, or the, as I scale up the biggest losses appear here, and this is still much better than eta to the power 216, right? So this is the actual uh, thing that, that was built. So we have like what was decided was to build a machine with 216 modes where you couple nearest neighbors in three dimensions and you have a lattice of, the, of size six by six by six. Unfortunately, the machine was not called the 666 machine, although I thought that would have been a great name. Um, yeah, so this is, the, this is the, the thing that was built, but then there is one extra thing that we should think about and is okay. So we have this machine that, that mixes 216 modes Let's say that the mean photon number per mode is, I don't know, a half. So we're gonna have on the average of a hundred photon, right? Um, how long would it take for a very good computational physicist to simulate this thing, to start to produce these patterns? So we tried to answer that question. And for that, we, we, we started to look in the literature. So, we know that for standard boson sampling, if you have N photons, the probabilities you need to calculate permanence of sizes n by n. Now, for sampling, uh, as I said, Neville and then Clifford and Clifford show that actually making the samples, not calculating the probabilities, has exactly the same complexity. So if you need to generate a sample with 300 photons, you need to do on the order of two to the 300 calculations. Okay. Now, for Gaussian boson sampling, we know that the probabilities are proportional to Hafnians. And uh, Andreas showed that the complexity of actuator happening is two to the n by two. So if here you needed 50 photons, here you're gonna need 100, at least for calculating probabilities and have the same complexity. And then what we showed is that this, this table has perfect symmetry. So also the complexity of sampling is also the complexity of calculating probability amplitudes. So if you want to make sure that your sampling takes on the order of two to the 50, here you need two to the 100. And as you see, as you saw before, if you have 216 modes and they're half occupied, you're kind of in the right ballpark, right? Great. Um, okay, so this is the actual machine that was built. Well, the schematics of the actual machine. So here you have a cavity that acts as an optical parametric oscillator. So it has many resonances. It has one resonance up there at 775. And there is one at 1550 down here, and then you can 
take one photon from up there and turn it into two photons down here. That's how you make your squeezing. You obviously have to stabilize it and make sure that things work, but uh, Lars and Mosen and Fabian are very, very good people at, at many of these things, so they got that nailed down. Then we need this variable beam splitter that allows you shot to shot, so pulse to pulse. You can either couple it completely, you can make, you can make it go through, or you could have 50-50 or 75-25, whatever you want. You can do that for each pulse as they come, right? And then here we have a fiber loop of duration that can hold one loop, one, one pulse, one that holds six, one that holds 36. And then um, these pulses are, are sent into 16 photon number resolving detectors. And the reason why there are 16 is to match the clock rate of the things that are in the left. So the natural clock rate of these photon number detectors, which are transition edge sensors. So they have very specific time characteristics. And so to, to make everything work at the same clock rate, we need to use 16 of them. So this is a machine that was built. And now we build that machine. Well, my colleagues, former colleagues built that machine. And we generated a million samples, which means we have this table that is of width 216 and of depth a million. And then what do you do with that? So imagine that I come and I give you a USB key and I said here, are a million samples of a Bernoulli process with three steps. So you toss a coin three times, and if you get heads, you add one, right? So you can have zero, one, two, or three. And I ask you, how do you verify that this data comes from that probability distribution? And I'll actually like to get an answer. No, no, anybody? You have a table or let's say a normal distribution and I have these numbers and I tell you this is normally distributed. How do you convince yourself that it's normally distributed? Plot. You plot it, right? So you, you kind of look at the frequencies at which this data occurs, right? And then you histogram it. Then you have kind of little probabilities for each possible outcome. And then you compare that with the thing that you expect. And if it looks like a nice bell-shaped curve with like, not to fat tails, you say, hooray, this is my Gaussian, right? Okay, but here there are two problems. The first one is that calculating the theoretical probabilities takes exponential time. But okay, let's assume that you're willing to pay for a really good supercomputer, at least to do kind of the small size ones, right? But the second one is the following. You have, um, you have your million samples and now you want to histogram them, right? So you want to, to assign probabilities to those based on how often you saw them. Now we have 216 modes, and let's say we count up to 10 photons, which means that our probability space is on the order, actually no, it's 10 to the 216. So in that million samples, I will see each sample exactly once. I will never see repetitions. And then if I want to assign Frequencies, what I do is I will say the samples that I saw, the probability is one in a million. And the samples that I didn't see, the probability is zero. And those two estimates are horrendously bad. They are far, far away from the actual probabilities. So not only it is hard to figure out what the theory predicts, but I will require an exponentially num large number of samples to start to assign good probabilities to the things that I actually measure. So, so that's uh, problematic to say the least. So what we can do is we can just start to come with plausibility tests and then maybe some more sophisticated tests about this. So, so here's the first test. We can look at two mode cumulants. So we can ask what is the correlation between different pairs of modes and we can compare the things that we measure with different hypotheses. So one hypothesis is that the light that I mix in my interferometer is a squeeze light, right? So it has noise below the vacuum limit. Another hypothesis is that they have these big fat blobs that, are, that kind of describe thermal statistics. And another hypothesis is that I have squash states, right? So states that somehow have phase dependent noise, but that don't have squeezing. And then I could also think about uh, kind of distinguishable squeeze states. So st st squeeze states that I don't allow to interfere, for example, because I don't send at the same time. So I can compare those two things and you can 
see that obviously this is the better explanation for at least this part of the problem, right? So the two mod cumulants kind of are explained extremely well by the uh, ground truth of the experiment, right? Another thing that I can do for which I do have sufficient statistics is just to coarse grain to sum the, 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 sam the, the, the number of photons for each sample and ask for the distribution of the total photon number. So that one I can estimate correctly. And what you see here is that by far the one that explains where the experiment in terms of width and height is again, the ground truth. And you can see that we measure all the way to more than 200 photons for some extreme cases. So we have a machine that is counting 200 photons kind of one at a time, which is really cool. Okay, then we can also ask, okay, how long would it take a classical adversary to simulate this machine? So the cost of simulation, I said it's exponential in the number of photons, but it's actually a little bit more complicated because now we have collisions. There is the possibility that sometimes we count two photons in the same detector. So the actual best known algorithm to simulate these machines is exponential in the number of detectors that collected at least one photon. This NC is precisely the number of detectors that, 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 that measure at least one photon. And then the base of that exponential is this number G which is kind of the geometric mean of one plus how many photons were there. This number is at least two, but if you have a lot of collisions, then it becomes greater than two, right? So we can plot this in a two-dimensional diagram. We can start to overlay different you know, times and it takes on the order of a year per sample. So a sample generating this machine runs in microseconds. And if you were to run this in a supercomputer at this scale, every year on average, you will get a sample. So you will have to wait some time. And moreover, uh, if you were to use a threshold detector, so these detectors that only tell you yes or no, then this G is, strict, is strictly one, sorry, strictly two, because you can only get to say yes, but you don't get to say how many. And so that data, for example, from the experiment from USCC lives down here. And actually, if you were to put some effort into simulating this machine, their machine, it would take maybe an hour or two in a supercomputer. So the machine is definitely making the, the life of this hypothetical computational physics, physicist uh, hard. And finally, or almost finally, we can also ask for this idea of the cross entropy. So I have my samples and then I can ask, what is the probability that I will have seen that sample, right? And if the samples come from the ground truth probability, mostly I should sample samples with a high probability that have high probabilities, right? That's what it means to have a high probability. So this logarithm of the probability of having seen that sample should be large. And then I can have some spoof, some spoofer, some adversary that says, I'm gonna give you some samples and I'm gonna try to, to fool you into believing that those samples came from the distribution that you wanted to sample from. So now I can calculate the cross entropy of those samples according to, again, the ground truth distribution. This zero is to indicate the ground truth. And so I can do that for a number of adversaries for coherent states, thermal states, squash states, distinguishable squeeze states, and this other adversary proposed by the Google people. And we see that in all cases, the cross entropy of the samples from the machine comes on top, which means the machine is better at sample numbers that have associated higher probabilities than the rest of the adversaries that we could come up with, which is kind of neat. And finally, we can now, instead of, of taking samples, we can consider different, uh, different hypotheses. So imagine that I give you a sample and I ask you which of these two hypotheses explains better that sample. So what you will do is you will calculate this, the probability of this sample according to this hypothesis and the probability of the sample according to this other hypothesis. And you will say, well, the one that has the highest probability is the one that explains better the data, right? So now here we take, we do that. So we take this ratio of the probabilities according to the ground truth and some of these adversarial hypotheses. And then we take the logarithm so that things don't blow up too fast. And we see that in all the cases, this number is positive, which means that this probability is larger than this probability. And so we say, okay, it also passes this, this Bayesian test that we, that we want to do. So these are all kind of plausible arguments, but we still don't have a smoking gun to claim what we would like to claim. And that, that I think, I hope you understand from the thing that I told you at the beginning. 
A, we cannot calculate these probabilities efficiently, and B, we cannot estimate the frequencies efficiently. So we have to come up with something better. That's something that people in my group are, are doing. So here is to summarize, then we have kind of three results. One is about a no-go result telling you how to not build these things. A second one is about how you could build them using this idea of having long range interactions mediated by, by keeping you know, pulses in fiber. Uh, a third one is about this complexity of sampling equals the complexity of calculating probabilities about how you get two to the n by two and two to the n by two in the right column of that table. Uh, and finally, there is the actual experiment that was built by, by my colleagues and that I have the pleasure of, of working with them in the, on the theory side or leading that, that theory side. There. And uh, with that, I think I'll conclude. Thanks. Right, so, uh, so the question was, if I am, I am kind of assuming that the losses are in some sense homogeneous. They all just go away, but maybe it's like if you have an H parameter, you could have a loss, let's say, for the reflection channel, which enhances the probability of going into Right. So, yeah, so, in, yeah. you know, for, for a theory, it's very convenient to think that the losses are just this thing that you can pull out at the front or at the beginning. Yeah. In practice, of course, they are not. They are, uh, they are inhomogeneous, although I don't think that's the right word. But anyway, they, they don't occur everywhere at the same time in the same way. They are kind of asymmetric, right? So you can construct uh, a T matrix that actually contains that information. And because in our case, the input is the same squeezing in all the modes, you still, the, the question, is there like a total loss that we can associate with this experiment? That's a well-posed question that we can answer just by knowing what the T matrix is. And in that case, it comes to be like three and a half or four dB. Oh, so the, the question is in the source, um, there are 216 uh, pulses that are produced. And the question is, are they indistinguishable? Did I refresh correctly? Yeah. Okay, so yes, they are to, to a very good approximation at least. So they all come from the same source, right? And, and the source is just a crystal. It's not a quantum dot that is seen. It's electromagnetic environment dancing around it. It's, it's just whatever the envelope of the pulse that came in and that drives the parametric processes, and then you get your squeeze light out. Yeah, but if you play correctly with the dimensions of the OPO and the pump, you can make sure that all the photons are produced in the same mode. And moreover, you can make sure that that mode is consistent as you just continue to you know, press the button to make more squeeze states. Yeah, I imagine that, that involves the stabilization capacity. Amongst other things, but also playing a lot with the with the pump pulse, making sure that it's kind of shorter than the decay time of, of the ring down time of the cavity, for example. So the question was, um, since the losses are kind of well, I'm gonna try to rephrase, and you tell me if I did a good job. Since the losses are kind of small in the fiber, right, and they're mostly happen at the source. Um, we could, in principle, have much longer delay lines. And not have the tree at the end for the PNRs. Yeah. Um, I guess you could have done that, but that's not the thing that was decided to do. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, so the the corollary question <laughs> is whether the losses are associated with the efficiency of generation, right? But actually, the squeeze state you're not post-selecting anything. The squeeze state has everything. So this has nothing to do with the efficiency of post-select. It has to do with the fact that you want most of the photons to generate here to actually do come out. And that is not easy. Like, you know, fiber coupling is always a problem, right? Um, yeah, that's why. Thank you. I don't know if it's okay. So the question is simple, like in the boson sampling, in the, what is the dimension of the Hilbert space of the output? of the experiment. What is the dimension of the Hilbert space of the output in the experiment? The dimension is like the size of that Hilbert space. It's roughly uh, the size of the combinatorial space that you get by thinking about N balls in M boxes. So it's some, you know, K choose L where K is linear in N and M and L is linear in N, something like that. 
Okay, okay. So it does it grows more linearly than exponentially yes, up to space. Yeah, but let me emphasize the size of the Hilbert space is not the problem. Like, you know, for this experiment, if you were to be explicit, you would say, well, in principle, you can have arbitrary number of particles because squeeze states don't have a well-defined number of particles. So it's kind of infinite to the power 216. But of course, that's wrong. You could then say, oh, the, the dimension of the Hilbert space is 10 to 216. But again, that is not what determines the complexity of the problem. The complexity of the problem is just how many photons you counted and where you counted them. That's the thing that makes life hard. It's not how many places these photons can land. That's, that's a distraction, that's fluff. I so. think that the last part where only the number of photons matters that, okay, I understand because I was not understanding how you can be sure that the sampling is doing what it's supposed to do if the output is, has too many possibilities. Right, so that leads to the point about validation that I was making towards the end of the talk. The only thing that we currently can do is we can rule out alternative hypotheses, but we don't have a smoking gun to say, yes, this was behaving the way we wanted to behave. Okay, nice, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so in the interest of time, unfortunately I'm, I'm probably uh, not gonna take any more questions, so let's uh, uh, end the talk and thank Nicola once more. Thanks. Oh. I forgot to say, so A, I'm looking for a postdoc. Um, so if you're looking for a postdoc and you want to stick around in Montreal, come and talk to me. And B, I am an editor for Quantum, which is a journal that is community driven and it's open access and nobody's trying to make money out of you. It has a very reasonable impact factor should you care about those things. We welcome submissions. The, the bar to, to be able to submit is, did you post your paper on the archive in the Quantum listing? then the editors will have a look at your paper at least. And we try to be reasonable. We are not nature trying to look for flashy things. We're trying to good, look for good things. Um, so do send us your papers. Thanks. <laughs>